In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know that summer is near, says Jesus to his disciples. And what a very bizarre image that seems to be in the context of what we have heard in that particular passage of the Gospel. Disaster and terror sweep across the earth and we know that summer is near. But we are told by Jesus that when the signs of the end appear, we are to lift up our heads. We are to keep our eyes fixed where they belong, which is on Jesus himself. The mystery, the strangeness of this passage in the Gospel only begins to resolve itself when we think about that strange image of summer coming. For us, whose trust is in Jesus, for us, what there is to look forward to is always the fulfilment of a promise. And that's why we lift our heads. And that's why it can seem like the approach of summer. At the beginning of the Old Testament lesson, we heard about how God would honour his promise. And at the very heart of all our thinking about Advent, about the coming end, about Jesus imminent, pressing upon us, at the heart of all our thinking ought to be that conviction of promise. We know the one in whom we have believed. We know who we have trusted. And so, as the world's history unfolds, we lift our heads and we think of promise because we know that the one who is coming is the one in whom we have put our trust. Now, none of this is easy to express in a world which quite likes clarity, which quite likes boundaries, which quite likes certainties. Because the trust that a summer is coming for creation, a fruition and fulfilment of creation as its creator binds all things together, that's fairly counterintuitive. It doesn't look very much as if it's happening as we look around. And it would be quite nice to know, if we want to know anything, exactly when we might expect it. And you don't need me to tell you that Christians throughout the ages have been very readily seduced into providing a series of highly inaccurate answers to that question, in spite of quite severe warnings from our Lord about it. This generation, says Jesus, will live to see it all. That is, this generation, every generation to whom the words of the Gospel are addressed, every generation sees the beginning of the end, because the end is always beginning. That's to say, the consequence of human sin and rebellion, the consequence of our self-willed chaos, is always beginning again. And every generation will live to see that. And in every generation, the word is exactly the same to believers. Lift your heads. Your salvation draws nigh. Summer is coming. And the sign of the Son of Man is over the horizon. Again, we could get this very badly wrong. We could say we Christians have been given the secret of the happy ending and so we walk through the miseries, sins and tragedies of the world with a little secret smile on our faces. And once again, we have given way to that temptation far too often. But it's not that we have that secret that makes us feel safer we have surely that secret, that mystery of God's promise that makes us more open, more expectant, more compassionate, more willing to meet Jesus. And that means meeting him in every moment that we encounter, in every person we encounter. Not shutting our eyes with that secret smile 
and walking on confidently unaffected by the tragedies of the world. But serving him, living with him, living in him, here and now, and allowing his spirit to work in us and with us. And that's really what all this is coming to, isn't it? Because the hidden theme of both our readings tonight, the secret that binds them all together, is the Holy Spirit. That one thing never spoken of in either of the readings, and yet actually central to the meaning of both. What is the promise of the Father in the New Testament? It's the Holy Spirit. So when Jeremiah speaks of the promise of God on the way, it's the Holy Spirit that is in view. And when Jesus tells his disciples to lift their eyes and keep them fixed towards the sign of the Son of Man, it's the Holy Spirit that is in question. The Spirit which opens our eyes, the Spirit which removes the dullness of our blinded sight, as the hymn says, and keeps our eyes upon Jesus and through Jesus on his Father. These are readings about the Holy Spirit. And as we approach the coming of Christ at Christmas, the coming of Christ at the end of all things, it's the Holy Spirit on whom our hearts and our minds need to be fixed. Advent is a strange time to be thinking about the Holy Spirit. It might be we've done that at Pentecost. Only, of course, the Holy Spirit is precisely what or who we have never done with. And it does us no harm to think of Advent as, in a very special sense, a season of the Spirit. The Spirit and the Bride say, come, did they? So perhaps we'd better listen to the Spirit and the Bride in the season saying, come. And it's the Spirit of the Most High, isn't it, that descends upon Mary to prepare the way for Christ in her body? This is a season of the Holy Spirit. A season when we think about how the Holy Spirit is that divine reality which lodges in us the confidence in God, the promise of God actually taking root within us, the covenant of grace within our souls and bodies made by the Spirit's indwelling. Now that's what this season is about. That is at the heart, surely, of our preparation to celebrate the Incarnation. That is at the heart, surely, of our prayer and our longing for the coming of Christ again. It is the Spirit who longs in us, who prays and sighs with those groans, those praying groans too deep for words, as St. Paul says in Romans 8. It is the Spirit we celebrate. It is the Spirit who lives in us in Advent and prays in us in Advent in that long Advent that all believers endure till the end of the world. And it's because of the Spirit that this is not just a season of distant longing for something we don't know about, but confident longing for what has begun. Because the Spirit is the pledge here and now of the promise. The Spirit is not a word spoken by God to us, the Spirit is the reality that takes hold of us and builds us into Christ. The promise of God is not an idea. The promise of God is the vitality of prayer and transformed life that the Spirit gives. So, that's something to celebrate in Advent. Not a note that we examine, a sort of IOU from God that may one day be cashed in, perhaps, not just an assurance that reaches our ears, but a life that takes over our heart. The life of the future that lives among us now. Stay in the city until you receive the promise of the Father, said Jesus. And that promise, which is the life of the Spirit, has been given us here and now. The pledge, the advanced reality. We who live in Christ's church live in a spirit-filled environment in which longing for fulfillment, for peace, for mercy and for justice define us, surround us and shape us in every way. We are 
a people of promise. And that's what the church is for. We exist as church, not simply to repeat words, not to disseminate ideas, but to be a place where the world may see God's promise coming to life. Do we look promising as a church? Do we look trustworthy? Do we look like signs of a future that the world would be delighted with? Well, you provide your own answers to those questions, no doubt. But I think you know where the theological answer lies, that there would be no point at all in there being a church if it were not that place of fleshed-out promise where the future has begun, where God shows that he is to be trusted because here and now he is transforming us into the likeness of his son as we live in love with one another and in service to God's world. The promise has come upon the world and what's happened is us. It sounds an outrageous claim and it is indeed a very unlikely one on the face of it and yet that's what it is. Whenever we celebrate the sacraments of the new covenant, whenever we baptize, whenever we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we say, here is the spirit at work, renewing men and women in becoming sons and daughters of the Father, renewing our fellowship and our life together through the bread and wine we share as the life of Jesus enters into them by the power of the Spirit. Here is the Spirit. And here, as we struggle for a holiness that eludes our every effort and yet is always on the edge of our reality, as we struggle for that to become more real in our lives, here is the promise in us. We are God's future. So it's not only that we are addressed with a gospel word in our reading this evening, keep your eyes fixed on the coming summer. We are the signs of the coming summer to the world around. And when we are able to see, to work through, to suffer and live through the pain and the distress of this age with compassion, with integrity and service, we become the signs of that coming summer for a world around. We show that we are not defeated by evil. We show that it can be different. We show God. So, as we prepare this year and every year to celebrate the coming of our Lord at Christmas and to look forward to his coming at the end of time, what God asks of us is quite simply to open our hearts more and more deeply to the reality of his spirit. What God asks of us is to live with a deeper and deeper longing, a deeper and deeper ache of yearning for his justice. What God asks of us is, to make, is that we become more and more truly and fully signs of promise and of presence, a promise that is already at work. And we do it in our prayer, in our service, in our life together, in our sacramental life, in our proclamation. We do it by leaving behind all those things that make us too readily content with how things are, too readily content with a broken world and a broken humanity. We ask God to renew our divine discontent day by day with ourselves and our world. And we give thanks that to each one of us is given a share, a taste for God's future. Not an idea, not a set of words, not a set of formulae, but here and now, that relationship to God the Father through Jesus Christ, in which our whole relationship with each other and with the entire creation is transformed. We have received the promise of the Father. Because of that, the world is changed. 
because our world is changed. We can change the world of others around us by the gift of that same spirit. So, lift your eyes. Keep them fixed on the Christ from whose broken body pours out the Holy Spirit. Keep your eyes fixed on the one who will heal and reconcile all things by his grace. Keep your eyes fixed on him who alone holds you before the Father in that relationship of love and trust and intimate prayer which will transfigure everything. Be people of promise. And as you in your different ways think about the ministry to which God calls you and the ministry for which this place prepares you and has prepared so many people over its long history, think how you will show God's trustworthy promise in what you do for him in his church. Amen.